Uh, welcome to the third of the Jean Monnet uh, webinars. I'm very uh, pleased to have you um, all here. I can see you all in the main room, which is, is very nice. So I know who's here and also who's not here. Um, so for Quo Vadis EU, um, we're going to be discussing uh, foreign policy vehicles uh, and the near neighborhood. Um, and we have a, a full slate of, of people today. Um, so we're going to have to go through them um, at a fairly rapid fire. Um, I'm delighted uh, that we've been able to uh, include so many people because it's, it's truly representative um, of the, the lecturers in this course. Um, first to go is going to be um, Dr. Alexander Matalar because he's uh, a busy guy and he's uh, been very kind to give us 10 minutes of his schedule. Uh, and he's going to round off the, uh, the 2011 conflict in Libya, which I think you'll remember uh, was, was a very um, compelling uh, presentation. Uh, after that, um, it's going to be uh, me giving you a brief overview of, of the ENP. Um, and after that, as you'll remember from, from last week, we had a, a guest lecturer, uh, Sumrian Costa, who I'm delighted to say has agreed to join us here uh, on, the, on the webinar. I think it's his first time on the webinar, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an introduction for all sorts of things. Um, and then after that, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Selen, um, he's going to be discussing trade and development, which um, I don't envy her to be able to pack that into 10 or 12 minutes, and then followed uh, by Dr. Joachim Kopf, um, who's going to be uh, rounding it out on, on NATO issues. Um, so without further ado, Alexander, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Well, well let's still call it good morning. Um, I'm uh, going to give you a very, very short overview of the uh, 2011 conflict in Libya. Uh, perhaps first a few words about why it matters in uh, a module on EU foreign policy. Well, it's fairly straightforward. It was the first time uh, since uh, about half a century that uh, some European nations uh, actually decided to intervene in um, an external conflict by themselves um, using, uh, using massive military force. <coughs> So obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting and uh, I think revealing case study uh, about um, how uh, defense policy in, in, in Europe is, uh, is developing, in, uh, has been developing in recent years and it also gives us some cues, I think, um, about the direction into which it will continue to develop in, in the years ahead. Um, as far as the structure is concerned, um, I will uh, just focus a bit on, on, on the motivations behind the decision to intervene in, uh, in, in the, the war in Libya, uh, the outcomes, and uh, give you some ideas uh, about what I think uh, are the, the future prospects uh, for European defense. But before we go on, uh, one important question to be asked is, well, this whole Libya thing, what, what actually happened? Uh, in that, uh, in that far away place about which we don't know so much. Um, well, as far as the, the story in the media is concerned, um, well, it's fairly straightforward. You had a whole bunch of revolutions throughout the, uh, uh, the Arab world, especially in Northern Africa. So it all started uh, when a certain chap called Mohamed Bouzizi uh, burned himself uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. Then you had instability in Egypt, and <clears throat> um, Libya was sort of third in the line. Um, uh, so to speak. Um, of course, the the whole narrative about the, the Arab Spring Rebellion uh, does not really do full justice to the fact that um, Libya, in historical terms, uh, was very much um, uh, a divided country, um, and uh, the, the eventual uprising that we saw against the regime of uh, Muammar Gaddafi can also be portrayed as sort of civil war between the two historical uh, entities um, that uh, that have constituted uh, what we now call call Libya. Before the Italians were in, were in Libya, it wasn't a single uh, single country after all. Um, there are also some dynamics that indicate that well, everything that was going on in Libya, to some extent, amounted to an interstate war uh, as well in the sense that. Um, the Americans, the British, the French, well, everybody suddenly started bombing uh, um, uh, the, uh, the regime of, uh, of, of, of Gaddafi, uh, doing so w with the consent uh, and, and, the, and a mandate from, from the UN Security Council. Um, but, but still, it's, it's, a, it's a situation, uh, it was a situation of, of, of war. Um, here in the West, we tend to portray this 
as uh, the, the most recent case of what we call the responsibility to protect doctrine, the idea that, well, uh, a state has the uh, responsibility to look after its own population, and if it fails to do so, um, then the idea is that this responsibility shifts to the level of the international community that can, if it so decides, step in uh, and, and take over uh, this responsibility. And uh, you, you will recall from, uh, from all the media reports um, uh, a year ago, or in, a bit similar to what is now going on uh, in, the, in the case of Syria, um, that we had uh, some sort of um, uh, duty to, to intervene and, and stop the slaughter that was, uh, that was ongoing and greater slaughter that was imminent in, in cities like Benghazi and, uh, and, and, and Misrata. Um, I'm just listing all these categories um, because I, I want to make sure that everybody has a sort of, well, uh, a minimally nuanced understanding uh, of, the, of the complexity of this conflict. That, it, well, you have all these overlapping categories, so to speak, and you can actually, um, um, you can actually construct a narrative uh, for, for, for each of them. Okay, but we were going to talk about uh, motivations. Uh, uh, to to intervene. Well, the the most um, um, the most clear cut and uh, uh, the most um, the most visible in the public discourse, I, I should say, is of course well the, the whole humanitarian concern um, that is uh, imbued in this uh, in this idea of responsibility to to protect. But <clears throat> one should of course not uh, forget that behind. Uh, this, um, this, this public discourse, there were a couple of other uh, issues playing a role as well, especially um, uh, migration ranks, uh, ranks very high on the list, on the list um, in the sense that, well, <clears throat> the, the rebellions uh, or the unrest in, in Northern Africa was, uh, was triggering uh, a pretty substantial flow of, of refugees from Northern Africa into Italy especially. Um, so, for example, in, by, by mid-2011, uh, over four, four, 45,000 refugees had, uh, had arrived on the uh, island of, of Lampedusa. Um, and, of course, if you think about Libya, well, it's only 200 nautical miles uh, away from, from Italy. So, uh, from, the, uh, from the perspective in Rome, uh, this is a pretty nearby issue. Um, of course, if you're into conspiracy theory, um, then on the internet you can no doubt find a lot of alternative stories about hmm, there's oil to be found in, in, in Libya and, and not any oil but uh, the, the expensive, uh, the very light, sweet crude, uh, the very light and sweet oil um, that um, uh, can, can be exploited uh, and in terms of well, there are oil, oil contracts to be renegotiated uh, after Qaddafi uh, would disappear so in, in that sense uh, some governments might have been thinking, well, if we sort of start off on good terms with uh, any new regime, it might pay off one way or the other. Um, of course, to what extent is this the realm of conspiracy theory or realpolitik? It's probably a bit of both um, in the sense, well, yes, these things can also play a role. But then again, um, the, the direct linkages are all at least from, from a scientific perspective, very, very difficult um, to prove. And even if you put yourself in the position uh, of somebody calling the shots in, uh, in one of the, the ministries involved, there are always very long um, chains of, well, if this happens, if this were to happen, then possibly it might pay off uh, in this way and that way. Uh, but it's, 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 it's never guaranteed. Uh, and uh, it, it probably goes way too far to, um, to suggest that um, uh, the whole economic story was uh, sort of cooked up uh, in, in advance. Um, but <clears throat> apart from um, the, the whole economic story, there is, of course, also the issue of, 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 of domestic politics. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this because um, uh, you, sh you should keep in mind that many of the the governments that decided to embark on uh, this uh, campaign of intervening in the, in the conflict in Libya were under a lot of public pressure to actually do something. Uh, and um, that was related to, to humanitarian concerns, the migration concerns. Um, but to some extent, 
uh, it was also prestige. Um, you can uh, perhaps recall that um, many of, uh, of, the, of the Western governments had pretty close uh, relationships with, for example, the regime uh, of Mubarak in, in Egypt. Uh, and everybody looked at this, well, like a bunch of idiots. Um, when it, it turned out that, uh, uh, that a lot of uh, high-level officials had rather uh, cozy contacts with, uh, with uh, authoritarian regimes, and Gaddafi, the guy who was more or less hated by everyone in the international community, provided a sort of scapegoat to, um, uh, to counter that, uh, that very perception. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to the outcomes. Uh, I think the most important issue to, to mention here is that the um, intervention in Libya sets a clear-cut precedent that uh, different, um, different international, international actors uh, um, drew lessons from. Um, and you can see that, for example, uh, now in the Libya debate, um, some governments, or at least some parts of, uh, um, of, uh, of governmental structures are saying, well, we've done it in Libya, what is now going on in Syria, it's, it's pretty shocking and uh, conceivably we can uh, put a stop to this. Um, but of course, um, the perception in, uh, in, in Moscow and in Beijing was, was rather different uh, in the sense that uh, they um, uh, abstained from, uh, from vetoing a Security Council resolution that gave a mandate to do something. And they thought, well, Western nations de facto interpreted this mandate pretty broadly uh, uh, with a view to um, interfere with the um, internal affairs of, of, of a state to a pretty, pretty large extent. Uh, and in that sense, it's a precedent that should, ne that should not repeat itself because one day, if this becomes uh, uh, an, ex an accepted norm, one day we might be caught on, 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 on the wrong side. Um, the second major outcome is that, uh, a bit unexpectedly actually, um, the United Nations seems to be in the lead on, on post-conflict uh, stabilization. Um, and um, uh, any EU involvement um, does not seem to be very high on, 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 on the agenda. <clears throat> um, as far as the, the situation uh, in, in Libya itself is concerned, most people would describe it as still as, as, as reasonably uh, chaotic. Uh, and it seems that that is also the, um, the main reason why uh, there is uh, not, a, not a very visible um, uh, uh, direction of, 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 of progress. Uh, for example, when it comes about the UN uh, engagement, uh, there was at some point a proposal to um, uh, make the EU responsible for, for border management. Um, but uh, as the uh, European institutions framed it, well, this would have to come on the invitation of, of the Libyan regime. But it seems that it is not really clear who is now really in control of what goes on in, in, in Libya. And as a result, the, the invitation uh, to the uh, European Union to, to assist um, has uh, not materialized. Um, something that we uh, also touched upon in class is that the, um, the conflict in Libya also um, uh, caused some sort of destabilization in, in, in the wider region. In the sense, well, Libya was uh, under the leadership of, uh, of, of Gaddafi, a very active uh, player in, um, in, in, in the northern half of the African continent, uh, so to speak, uh, sponsoring um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, regional initiatives, investing a lot of money uh, in neighboring countries, um, and a lot of um, uh, of workers from um, from poorer countries in the in, in the Sahel region were also well not migrant workers in, uh, in 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 the Libyan economy, and that whole sort of um, house of cards has uh, has now collapsed. And it is uh, proving some something very challenging uh, for the for the region uh, to deal with because now while all these migrant workers have returned home, um, there is already um, a, a food crisis uh, that is uh, that is projected to become 
more acute in, in, in the Sahara and Sahel region. Um, uh, and, and all these dynamics seem to, to blend together um, and uh, are uh, well, putting all the international actors, um, confronting them with, uh, with major challenges. Okay, my thoughts on future prospects. Um, <clears throat> I think the big one here is that after the um, military intervention in, in Libya, we are now entering a phase of, uh, of soul searching on European defense. Uh, it seemed that in um, uh, a situation that, that was sort of the ideal um, situation where Europeans could conceivably take the lead by themselves, um, the sort of um, uh, rerun of the conflicts in, in, in the Balkans in the 1990s, um, it seemed that after creating all the institutions designed specifically to enable the Europeans and the European Union to deal with this autonomously, it still did not work out. And it did not work out because there was not an agreement amongst European states on, on what to do. Uh, and in, in that sense, there was again uh, um, uh, a return to the, the sort of fallback option uh, of coordinating things bilaterally and coordinating things through the, the, the NATO framework. Uh, but what you can already see is that um, a lot of the member states that have worked together on the Libya case, think Britain, France, um, uh, think uh, uh, all the small NATO allies flying, uh, flying F-16s, which were very active uh, in, in the Libya campaign, uh, they're so, sort of thinking, well, perhaps we should work closer together with the countries that we know are on the same page, uh, and that is not uh, a group that is that is coherent on on the European level. Uh, you very much have small islands of of uh, cooperation, replacing the uh, the idea of uh, um, of uh, European wide defense integration. Um, the uh, the second major prospect. I think is, well, <clears throat> the message has hit home that the Americans are going to use their, um, uh, their vast amount of, of, of attention and resources mostly elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, they are giving up entirely on, uh, uh, on being active in, uh, in the European security architecture, but uh, about a year ago, um, Secretary Gates, then Secretary Gates, I should say, sent a very clear message here in Brussels. Hey guys, we're not going to keep on uh, sponsoring European security on our own. Uh, we need our money, our attention, our resources. We need it elsewhere, namely, to some extent still in, in, in the Middle East, but above all in the Asia Pacific region. And that means, well, at some point, uh, the Europeans will uh, have to um, uh, sign up to a greater level of responsibility for their own neighborhood, um, possibly eastern neighborhood, but definitely, as, as Libya showed, uh, southern neighborhood. Uh, and as far as that southern neighborhood is concerned, uh, my take would be that we are entering a, a very dynamic environment in the sense that, well, all the big players in, in the region I'm thinking about Egypt, uh, I'm thinking about Turkey uh, as, as, as the main players, but then there are also other important theaters, now Syria uh, and to, to a lesser extent probably the, the, the Sahel. Now, all these players and regions are essentially in flux and we don't have a very good idea of, 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 of what's coming, but we know that the future is going to look probably very different uh, from, from the past uh, as we knew it. Uh, so. For, for all of us um, within uh, the national ministries as, as well as within academia, I think it will be a, a very exciting but possibly also rather scary time ahead. Uh, with this, uh, I'll rest my case and I think I'll head to the next meeting. Thank you very much, Alexander, for the um, searingly strong overview. I think the nice thing about the webinars, in a sense, um, is not just a chance to cover things again, but um, also to do it uh, in, in a way that's um, uh, really uh, honest as well. So that uh, was a very good um, focus from, um, 
from Alexander. I'm going to go pretty briefly through the ENP, um, not only because um, I just touched on it last uh, last Friday, so you should all remember it, uh, but also because I really don't want to uh, erode the time um, of speakers who who taught you um, uh, longer ago than I did. So you you'll remember the uh, the tirade that I had on Friday, speaking about um, the the sort of bipolar qualities, if if you like. Um, of the ENP, and I suggested actually that the two founding documents there are the European Security Strategy and also the wider uh, Europe neighborhood. Um, the first one, I think, uh, is a very uh, anxiety-ridden understanding of keeping threats, naming threats and keeping them at arm's length, um, using buffer zones and cultivating them in the identity uh, of allies, uh, resorting to a, a series of international relationships and regimes and treaties. Uh, to sort of lock down the area without necessarily rolling up your sleeves and getting getting your hands dirty. Um, so if you have a look, as I suggested, at, at the wording of the ESS, both the 2003 and the 2008 iteration, um, you're, you're you're seeing this this sense of um, tremendous insecurity uh, which needs to be tackled um, through transformations, but security-driven transformations. The countries there are described as volatile. They need to be, um, the, the sting needs to be drawn from them. They need to be transformed somehow into a ring of well-governed countries. Uh, given the fallout of the Arab Spring, which I think Alexander has, has touched on nicely, certainly um, the, the, this volatile, very dynamic neighborhood uh, is indeed the, the reality that we're looking at now. The question is, does the, the ethos of the second document, the 2003 wider Europe neighborhood document and, and the successive strategy the following year, is, is, it, is it a strong enough mandate to be able to tackle uh, through integration, not necessarily security first, but integration first, the, the uh, political instabilities there, the economic uh, lack of development, the tremendous divisiveness in society um, in, in that environment. Um, and again, if, again as, as Alexander said, cards on the table, my suspicion at this point is while there's a tremendous this opportunity in the southern neighborhood. I don't know if the ENP itself is a robust enough political structure uh, to be able to manage that either uh, as a development structure uh, or as a, certainly as a security structure. So a few brief slides now um, on the uh, profile or the identity, if you like, of the ensuing Euro European neighborhood policy. The 04 strategy paper uh, made very clear. Um, who uh, incorporated the neighborhood, the Med region, obviously, and, and the Eastern region, and that the desired end, somehow a, an uneasy compromise, if you like, between political and economic incentives and security and reform-driven incentives, um, the end is a privileged relationship that stops well short of membership, but goes much, much further than, than previous bilaterals, ENP action plans. Um, and to some extent. Uh, I did a brief discourse analysis, which is always fun. I would encourage you to do that. It's, it's, it's a, a tremendously flexible methodology. Um, and again, here is the, the, the snapshot of what the ENP is and crucially what it is and what is on offer, the, the deeper political relationship uh, and also quite possibly full-blown economic integration um, using uh, the, the customs union or a variety of deep free trade agreements but as you know, um, this is a this is a very much uh, strings attached agreement. Uh, it's it's on the condition uh, not only that these neighborhood states share the values, uh, but they make a real effort to continue to share the values um, that they, they they sign up to an EU template in terms of uh, good governance and democracy, um, and even the sort of neoliberal principles of how to run a market. And as you can see in in the in the in the last sentence. Despite all that, the the incentives are, are are a little blunt. I wouldn't say that there's anything close to a golden or possibly even a silver carrot, as it says. The ENP remains distinct from the process of enlargement. And yet, you read that caveat in, in, in the last line, it doesn't prejudge how the relationship with the European Union may develop in the future. Um, and as, as Professor Costa mentioned uh, last week, uh, there are there's some very serious ambitions in Eastern Europe uh, to, to blaze a trail towards membership, regardless of the, the, the wording, if you like, of, of, of the ENP. Um, here's a snapshot basically on the, the ideas of the, of the action plans, of course. What it is, it's a series of strategic um, and chronological uh, benchmarking. Uh, there's a repetition of the, the views of the European neighborhood. I think from my perspective, I see the ENP um, as the next biggest form of foreign policy in an incredibly wide geographic area after enlargement. In a sense, because of the tremendous success of enlargement, the European Union felt that there was a template, a reformist, 
a transformative template which they could easily unroll to a variety of uh, states, either volatile from a security perspective or underdeveloped uh, from an economic political perspective, where the EU could reinforce relations and promote the prosperity and stability of these nations but at the same time reinforce its own security. So it's a sort of everybody wins kind of scenario, and that's a very successful um, quality for foreign policy. If you can sell to the person that you're trying to influence, the idea that they're winning, they're not giving up, and you're winning at the same time, there's a very strong idea of mutual interest um, and in terms of reciprocity, that's, that's very winning, that's very compelling. It's difficult to turn down that sort of um, that offer, especially if it's coming from the largest economic market in the world. So therefore, um, you have, I think, a, a slightly uneasy sense of who is in the neighborhood. Obviously, it's easy to type out the, the, the list of states, but some are, are, are more in than out, as you can imagine. The, the question with Syria right now uh, has this gigantic question mark over it. Syria, indeed, uh, never signed an association agreement, so they are missing <clears throat> very fundamental bilateral legal framework, even to kickstart a neighborhood one. How it develops with Libya, I think, will be interesting. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a good question to, to bear in mind. You'll have the benefit of seeing Alexander again this Friday to talk about strategic culture. Um, the ENP obviously works uh, in a variety of ways, but you are focusing on political and ec economic um, transformations via deep and bilateral relations on, as I said before, the shopping list, if you like, the EU normative shopping list. So you have to tick the following boxes in order to make sure that you're, you're moving ahead. You you want to deepen your relationship with the European Union, you want to kickstart and consolidate and crucially institutionalize your joint uh, bilateral action plan, that's fine. That means you're going to be sitting down, you as an ENP state, with the EU to negotiate the benchmarks tailor-made that work best for your country given the degree of political structures, given the strengths or weaknesses of the economic um, structures in that area, given the necessary overhaul of the judicial, legislative, executive um, structures in that, in that area. So we have seen 12 action plans um, fully agreed to. Uh, and they've moved into their second generation. Uh, but there's, uh, there's a series of laggards, if I can put it this way, uh, not unsurprisingly for, for Algeria. Um, Belarus, of course, where it's effectively frozen diplomatic status between itself and the European Union. Libya, um, although I, I, I hope to see some, some form of, of development there. And, and Syria, um, it's, the, it's the opposite of frozen, it's, it's on fire. Um, that's the end for me. I'm delighted to turn over, therefore, briefly to Dr. Simeon Costa, uh, the guest lecturer on, on the EU's Eastern Partnership. Simeon. Hello. I'm uh, Simeon Costa, and uh, I will talk uh, with you about the Eastern uh, Partnership. First of all, um, uh, what uh, is the reason for uh, an Eastern uh, Partnership? We have, uh, uh, we have uh, um, a Mediterranean uh, policy, uh, we have a Union for Mediterranean, but uh, we need also an um, uh, Eastern uh, dimension. So uh, the Eastern uh, Partnership is a strategic project of the EU for the consolidation of the European neighborhood uh, policy towards the six ex-Soviet uh, countries uh, in the Eastern uh, Europe, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and uh, Ukraine. Therefore, all the 27 EU member states and the six uh, countries mentioned above uh, are part of the Eastern uh, Partnership. So uh, all uh, our um, uh, EU countries are uh, members in uh, this uh, project. Uh, at first, the project was proposed by uh, Poland and uh, uh, Sweden through their foreign uh, uh, mon uh, ministers, uh, Sikorski and uh, Karl uh, Bildt, uh, in the General Affairs and External Relations uh, Council in uh, 2008. And, uh, uh, Maybe the, the main uh, step uh, is the uh, Eastern Partnership Summit in Prague in uh, 7th uh, May 2009. There is a, an EU interest and um, uh, there is an Eastern interest for uh, this um, um, project. The EU uh, has, uh, uh, as you know, a strong geostrategic interest in having a ring of friends in the Black Sea area as as in the uh, Mediterranean uh, area, in order to uh, ensure its uh, peace, security, and stability at eastern borders, but also to ensure the security of its energy supply. 
um, Russia is the main uh, supplier uh, with uh, gas for the EU and uh, and the pipelines are uh, in the uh, in this region of uh, uh, eastern uh, countries um, of course the european uh, values uh, are very uh, important uh, and uh, of course the eu promotes uh, these values uh, democracy rule of law respect for human rights the principles of market economy, sustainable development, and good governance. The six republics are interested in intensifying their relations with EU and in benefiting from political and financial support of EU, even if each one of them has in its own aims, different from one, uh, different from one uh, another. Um, of course, uh, the Moscow perspective is uh, different. Uh, uh, Moscow regards uh, this uh, project as uh, uh, an intent to expand the sphere of influence of um, uh, Western uh, countries of uh, EU uh, and so on. Um, uh, but uh, this is their uh, way of uh, thinking. Um, actually, uh, the Eastern Partnership is an answer uh, to um, a call from uh, uh, Eastern uh, countries. So they they asked for this uh, project. Uh, this is not uh, a, a project um, uh, for expanding sphere of uh, influence, but an answer. And um, uh, if in the southern uh, region uh, uh, we have the neighbors of Europe. In Eastern uh, region, we have uh, European countries, and uh, some of them have uh, strong uh, European uh, aspirations, and this is, uh, uh, this is very important. What are the innovations of the Eastern uh, Partnership? Uh, first of all, new association agreements. Uh, you know, uh, in the um, in Mediterranean area, we already have association agreements. But uh, in, in the East, now uh, we negotiate uh, new, um, a new generation of uh, agreements. Um, and uh, uh, this is a very complex uh, process. And, and um, uh, uh, those uh, treaties uh, will be very uh, complex. Uh, uh, that uh, responds uh, to, to the need to have uh, a real political association and uh, um, uh, an economic uh, integration. Um, uh, in the economic area, deep and comprehensive uh, uh, free trade area is the aim. Um, um, for example, um, uh, the, um, uh, an important MEP, Elmar Brock, said uh, um, a Norwegian uh, solution uh, can be uh, implemented uh, with uh, those uh, Eastern uh, partners. Of course, uh, uh, energy security for uh, EU and for uh, its uh, Eastern partners uh, is very, very uh, important. Uh, but for the citizens, it's important to have uh, um, uh, visa liberalization. This is uh, uh, a future uh, prospect, uh, um, and uh, there is an important dialogue. Mobility and the security pacts are uh, uh, negotiated uh, with uh, uh, those uh, states, and the uh, beneficiaries uh, would be uh, uh, seven. Uh, uh, six uh, million uh, people who live in the six republics, uh, most of them are living uh, in uh, Ukraine. Another uh, uh, innovation is uh, increased people-to-people -people contacts and greater involvement of civil society and other stakeholders, including the European uh, Parliament. This is done throughout uh, civil society forums and uh, by founding the Euronest uh, Parliamentary Assembly. Programs financed by uh, EU for improving the administrative capacity of the six republics for supporting the economic and social development. Uh, additional financial support for the Eastern uh, uh, states uh, uh, is uh, provided. 
um, creating four multilateral policy platforms of cooperation, including reunions concerning democracy, good governance and uh, stability, economic integration and convergence with uh, EU uh, policy, uh, energy security, contacts between uh, people. And the five uh, flagship uh, initiatives regarding uh, border uh, management, um, uh, electricity market integration, uh, developing the southern energy uh, corridor, uh, and this is uh, this is uh, important. So the Eastern Partnership um, uh, is important because uh, uh, brings a strengthening of of uh, the ENP and uh, uh, do not forbid the European prospect for uh, the countries that uh, really uh, wish that. Uh, there is um, there is the Article 49 uh, of the um, uh, EU Treaty, the Lisbon uh, Treaty, that um, uh, allow allows to uh, any European democratic country to apply for um, uh, membership. So so this uh, could be uh, the future for uh, for those countries when uh, those countries will be uh, prepared and. The, uh, when uh, the uh, EU itself uh, will be uh, prepared. Uh, what is the political and the institutional uh, uh, structures of the Eastern uh, Partnership? Basically, there will be a governmental uh, dimension, an intergovernmental uh, dimension uh, with uh, uh, summits, with um, uh, ministers of foreign affairs uh, reunions, uh, with um, um, uh, other uh, official uh, reunions. Uh, there will be, and uh, there is uh, uh, already a parliamentary uh, dimension, uh, and this is the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly, and um, uh, the Eastern Partnership Civil uh, Society Forum. Uh, this is important because, um, uh, look, uh, we have a non-governmental dimension of the Eastern uh, Partnership. Of course, at governmental level, uh, we have uh, problems, we have uh, authoritarian uh, tendencies, we have uh, corrupt uh, gover uh, governments, um, uh, we have um, uh, problems in the uh, economic uh, area. Uh, there is a problem at the level of political class, but uh, the Eastern Partnership opens um, uh, um, a way for um, uh, cooperation at the non-governmental uh, um, level, uh, um, and uh, um, the NGOs, the professional associations uh, are... Um, uh, invited to uh, participate. Of course, uh, bilateral cooperation will continue within the structures of the ENP2. Uh, what about uh, Russia? The Eastern Partnership does not include uh, Russia, but it develops together with the strategic partnership EU-Russia. Despite the accusation brought uh, to the leaders in Kremlin, the Eastern Partnership is not an anti-Russian initiative. Through this project, EU answers to a will expressed by the countries in the eastern neighborhood uh, which want to deepen and extend their relations uh, with EU. EU representatives always uh, point out that the members of the Eastern Partnership will need good relations with all their neighbors, including the Russian Federation, but not only with the Russian Federation. Russia is still a strategic partner for EU uh, with whom they are negotiating a new comprehensive uh, agreement. According to the declaration in uh, Prague, the third state, especially Russia, will be eligible for uh, participating in concrete uh, uh, projects, activities and reunions of uh, track uh, platforms. Um, and um, um, the, uh, the Russian reaction is, uh, is still um, uh, hostile, not very hostile, but um, uh, hostile. Um, they, uh, uh, the Russian uh, geopoliticians, journalists, uh, and some uh, officials uh, said uh, uh, 
uh, look, uh, this is the final assault uh, of uh, great powers uh, from uh, Western Europe against former uh, Soviet Union uh, states. Uh, this is uh, this is um, the mentality of um, uh, a citadel under uh, siege. Of course, uh, uh, there are problems uh, in uh, eastern uh, region. Uh, Belarus is the last dictatorship uh, in uh, Europe, and uh, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan have authoritarian uh, regimes which uh, violate uh, uh, human rights. Uh, the Yanukovych regime in Ukraine practiced selective justice against uh, opposition. Uh, the president Lukashenko in Belarus is a communist dictator known for his uh, policy which uh, violates uh, uh, human rights. The frozen uh, conflicts uh, and um, uh, all the other uh, conflicts uh, uh, tell a lot about the instability of the region. Uh, we have uh, authoritarian tendencies in Azerbaijan and uh, in um, Armenia. Uh, uh, Ukraine, after the Orange uh, Revolution, uh, uh, had uh, uh, European uh, aspirations. So uh, Ukraine was uh, um, was angry uh, why this Eastern Partnership uh, does not uh, uh, bring uh, that uh, perspective. And uh, also, the uh, president of EU Ukraine uh, PCC in the European Parliament uh, said uh, uh, this is a beautiful package which is empty inside. Uh, from this, uh, from this uh, perspective of uh, uh, EU uh, membership, uh, you can judge if this uh, is true or uh, uh, not. However, a small uh, uh, a country like uh, Georgia is very strong uh, pro-European, uh, 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 but uh, but uh, Georgian-Russian war in uh, August uh, 2008 has uh, uh, its uh, consequences. The last uh, country I uh, I mentioned is uh, uh, Moldova because uh, in uh, this uh, period uh, the Republic of Moldova is the most democratic and um, the most uh, pro-European country in the Eastern uh, Partnership. The Alliance, Alliance for uh, the European Integration and its uh, government won several uh, successive uh, elections in 2009-2011 and implements pro-European reforms. This evolution in Moldova is in contrast with the situation uh, in other Eastern uh, Partnership countries uh, where authoritarian tendencies increased in 2009-2012. Uh, 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 of course, uh, the interest uh, of uh, the EU uh, increased, uh, including the level of uh, uh, financing. Thank you. And I wait for your uh, questions. Thank you very much indeed, Simeon. That was a, an excellent overview. Uh, it's not difficult to capture uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, in a few minutes, but I think you, you did very well indeed. Um, so I'm now going to hand over uh, to Selen, uh, who is going to talk to you briefly about uh, trade and development. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Amelia, for a short introduction. I'm going to cover uh, EU's trade policy and development policy, but I'm actually going to mostly concentrate on how trade and development policy interact with each other. So as you might know, um, EU's trade policy is one of uh, EU's most successful external uh, policies. Um, I'm going to actually frame my presentation today around three questions. So uh, these are all also the, the aims of this presentation. So what are we going to get from this presentation is uh, I'm going to address what are the main objectives of EU's trade policy and why does it matter? Why does trade matter? Um, what are the development objectives of the EU and how consistent is trade policies with these objectives? And then how does actually, I'm going to have to refer somehow to explain actually how trade and growth and poverty reduction interact with each other. And what are the tools that DG Trade has uh, at hand to actually make an impact on, on, on growth and poverty reduction, especially in the, in the least developed countries. So 
Um, in order to have a better understanding of what um, EU trade policy is doing today, I'm just going to very briefly mention what EU trade policy uh, was before and how it has evolved. So, as um, as you might have known, um, originally the idea of the of trade was actually to establish a common market. So the idea was to get rid of all the borders within the European Union, and also establish an external trade, uh, which is the the common uh, referred to as the common external tariffs of the of the EU trade policy. So basically, by uh, getting rid of all the barriers within the European Union, what was intended to be achieved was to have a free flow of goods, services, people, and capital. Since the 1970s, EU's external trade has become an EU competence. What that means is that since the 1970s, none of the member states can actually negotiate trade agreements by themselves. That has to be done at the EU level. And um, what we actually see in the original Article 113 of the treaty is a trade policy that only refers to tariffs. And, um, and then we, well, it is now called Article 133, and in the new Article 133, the actually the scope of this article was extended to include international negotiations. So we've seen that now what was an internal case was the abolition of tariffs within the European Union has now become uh, expanded to include international negotiations and agreements, but also issues other than goods. It, it also included services and intellectual property rights. And uh, as you might have known, with the new treaty of, on the functioning of the European Union, in Article 207, we now have investments included in the common commercial policy of the EU. What that means is that EU is not only going to negotiate uh, free trade agreements at bilateral and multilateral levels, it is also going to be able to negotiate bilateral investment treaties. But this is a rather um, new change, so we don't we don't see any we don't have an example of this yet. It is actually in process of being integrated in the in the European law. So, um, as we all know, DG Trade is in charge of the implementation of the Common Commercial Policy of the EU. And when we look at their mission statement, we see that um, their status. Um, in, um, purpose is to actually secure prosperity, solidarity, and security in Europe and around the globe. And how does DG Trade actually achieve that? Is by negotiating bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, and they also actually watch what other countries are doing. So that means that they ensure that the rules that have been agreed are actually applied, both at the bilateral level and the WTO level. Um, why is trade so important is that EU is become now the largest trading bloc in the world and uh, what EU trade does and what its policy does has a huge impact on trade of third parties and also on the development objectives of the developing countries. So just to give you an idea about what the amount of trade was for EU is that this is a, just a snapshot of 2009 figures. On the on the left column, we have EU's imports from top five countries, and on the right hand side, in the blue one, we have EU's exports to the um, these top top five partners. And as you can see, the, the imports come from the same countries as the exports go to. And the number one trading partner of EU by far is the USA. Um, and the extra EU trade uh, amounted to be 1.6 trillion um, euros in 2009 and exports 1.5 uh, trillion euros again in 2009. And again, US is both the, the biggest, largest import partner and export partner of the EU. And the second Leads followed by China. We have Japan, India, Russia. Russia has taken um, an increase actually in in the late years, and that's uh, due to um, an increase in um, in the, actually the cost of um, cost of energy. So um, the main concern of EU's trade policy is actually to provide access um, to foreign markets, because. Over uh, the years, with uh, successive rounds of uh, uh, multilateral negotiations at the WTO, um, the industrial uh, goods 
tariffs have largely came um, to very low levels. And uh, what we have now is a very high um, trade tariff levels at our, on, on agricultural products and also on, um, on non-agricultural goods at the developing countries. So EU's trade policy is actually trying to um, have access to, to foreign markets and the idea for that is to increase uh, EU's competitiveness and also help um, boost the economic growth in the in the European Union. Um, to have a short um, um, background to what has happened uh, recently was that um, during the negotiations uh, at the multilateral level at the WTO, when uh, Pascal Lamy was the um, was the uh, <clears throat> was at the European Union, he has actually put a moratorium on new bilateral negotiations, which actually meant that there was going to be no new negotiations started with a with a third party, and that was to fully concentrate on multilateral negotiations. So by far, still um, EU's uh, main emphasis is on multilateral negotiations, which are negotiated at the WTO level, um, but because of the recent um, suspension of the negotiations at the WTO level, we now have um, actually a new um, agenda that actually came into force in 2006. It was called the Global Europe Communique. It was when Peter Mandelson was at the, at the Commission, um, and that was actually to follow um, a very uh, ambitious, deep free trade agreements. And there were um, a few um, countries that were selected as uh, as uh, candidates for uh, with whom the, the EU was going to follow these free trade agreements. Um, so now we have um, negotiations that are uh, started in shortly after the Global Europe Communique in, with India, ASEAN, Canada, and South Korea. And South Korea has just been um, actually concluded. Um, what does the free, free trade agreement do is that um, at a very simple level, um, when two parties are negotiating to have a free trade agreement, that means that they will have no tariffs. It means all tariffs on all goods will be reduced to zero. What we have now is that, for example, this is a EU tariff profile, and uh, on top you see a summary of simple average final bound. On average, EU's tariffs are 5.2%, which is low. And we, when we look at agricultural products, you can see that it's 13.5%. It's slightly higher. And then non-agricultural goods is only 3.9%. So these are relatively reduced rates, especially when we compare it to other developing countries. We see that these rates are much higher. And then um, what, of course, these summaries hide is that um, there are often peaks um, when we look at product groups, um, as, as you would know, there are high tariff peaks um, within the agricultural products, but also within the non-agricultural products, we can also find some tariff peaks, for example, as high as 22% in, for example, transport equipment, the, the second line from the bottom. Um, and for example, textiles, clothing, and leather, they, they all have uh, relatively higher um, tariff rates. But on, on average, of course, they might, be, they might be much lower. For example, for leather, you can see that the average tariff is 4.2, but there's a tariff peak of, uh, of 17% uh, within the same uh, product group. So what that means is that when you signs Korea, uh, for example, the free trade agreement with Korea, that means that all these uh, tariffs are going to come down to zero between EU and South Korea. These are the rates that then EU applies to other EU, sorry, WTO member states. These are the MFM rates. Um, what happened at the um, multilateral negotiations um, between EU and WTO was that there was a very generous offer. As you know, the WTO round started in 2001 and it was expected to be completed by 2004. But um, with the financial crisis, the last ministerial was held in 2006 and there was already a suspension in 2000, sorry, to, there was a mini, mini ministerial in 2008 and uh, the DDA was suspended in 2006. So um, there has been not much going on. Uh, the priorities have overtaken, but mainly the reason for that is that um, this is just an overview of what uh, has happened over the years. Um, to at the WTO level is that um, the, the WTO has actually grown from um, uh, 23 members to 
123. And then, as you can see, the, the initial rounds only covered tariffs on goods. And then things started getting slightly more complicated as trade has become more complicated. As you can see, there are other issues that have been discussed at rounds like anti-dumping measures, non-tariff barriers, services, intellectual property rights, and textile agriculture. And these have all complicated um, the negotiations. So um, the July 2008 package was the last one, and the EU's offer was very generous, but um, um, that was it. There hasn't been much uh, happening since then, so there has been an, an, an impetus on the, an emphasis on, on bilateral negotiations. So currently, we have still Canada, Ukraine, India, ASEAN negotiations, bilateral negotiations going on, and we have South Korea negotiations concluded. And it has been provisionally applied since July 1st, 2011. And, and I just put in some numbers about some of the reported, actually expected outcome uh, for, from the EU's perspective out of this free trade agreement. Um, and I, I think I'm going to skip over rather fast into my next section and trying to actually make a connection between trade and, and growth and poverty. Um, so basically, EU's trade is important for itself and for, for third parties. Um, theoretically, um, we know that trade has a positive impact on economic growth. But uh, we also know that growth doesn't automatically translate into poverty reduction, and especially the attainment of development goals. So what we see over the years is that uh, world income has increased, as we see that trade has also increased. And we know that trade openness can actually contribute to growth by actually introducing efficiency in the use and allocation of resources. Um, but um, trade can also have a very significant income distribution effect within the host country. And that actually creates both winners and losers. And this is where trade and development actually intersect. So um, between countries, we say that um, both wins. It's a win-win situation when we talk about, for example, EU and a third party. But within the third party and within the EU, there is going to be winners and, and losers. So accordingly, um, international trade then has uh, an impact on poverty reduction. And growth effects of trade doesn't always translate into being pro-poor. So this is um, why this has become a very uh, sensitive issue, and uh, and EU trade policy recognizes this, that the, its trade policy does have an impact on developing countries. So by far, again, this, the the most important tool is the completion of the Doha round, but given the the circumstances, EU has other actually policy tools that are also very very powerful, such as the generalized system of preferences, economic partnership agreements, and aid for trade. I'm going to very briefly introduce what um, the generalized system of preferences is. It is unlike a free trade agreement, it is unilateral, it's non-reciprocal, which means that the EU unilaterally opens its market to 176 developing countries. That includes countries that are uh, least developed countries. And EU was the first to implement uh, a GSP system. It started in 1971. Other countries that also offer GSP systems to, to developing countries is US, Canada, um, Japan. Um, Actually, the GSP stated um, mission statement is the primary objective is to contribute to the reduction of poverty and promotion of sustainable development and good governance. Um, how it works is that we have three parallel schemes that are running within the GSP scheme. The first one is known as the standard GSP arrangement, offering preferential access to 176 countries. Then there is the second one that is commonly known as the GSP plus which is the Special Incentive Arrangement for Sustainable Development and Good Governance. And that's available to countries that ratify certain international uh, agreements, such as in, um, International Labor, Environmental, and human, human Rights Conventions. And the last one is the Everything But Arms Arrangement that actually provides duty-free and quota-free access to the, only the least developed countries. Um, what is on the table for developing countries is that um, there is tariff-free access um, to more than 50% of all tariff lines to the EU. 
um, but there are some um, sensitive products uh, that are not on the, on the table. And for those sensitive products, um, there is a reduction on the tariff of 3.5 percentage points of the MFN rate. What is in the sensitive product list is that certain categories that e either EU is competitive or not, or, or in a certain product category, um, usually we find these products within the manufacturing sector, still textiles, clothing, and footwear, as from the previous slides we've seen there is uh, some high um, tariff peaks there. And as you would expect, some of the sensitive products um, categories are coming from the from the agricultural products um, that are covered under EU's common agricultural policy. Um, so these products are not actually um, duty free, and uh, although they are covered in the general system of preferences. What the economic partnership agreement uh, is, is um, in contrast with the GSP system, it is a free trade agreement. And it dates back to the signature of the Cotone Agreement uh, that was signed in 2000. And um, um, the idea was that um, that when the Cotone Agreement was signed, this was, there was a trade part to do to the agreement, but it was not deemed to be WTO compatible. And there was a deadline given, which was the end of 2007, that there had to be a new um, agreement that had to be negotiated. And this is the this is actually. Um, what the economic partnership agreements go back to. So the, the EPAs have been negotiated with the ACP countries and they were launched in 2007. They have been rather slow moving and the first uh, agreement was signed with CARIFORM in October 2008. It is a rather ambitious agreement that was covered um, that was covering goods and services, investment and trade related issues intellectual property rights, and there's also a link to development cooperation. And soon after the EC reform EPA, other countries joined in to sign. Um, but um, overall, um, it is a very slow moving process. The idea here is that, of course, um, in the Article 208 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, we see that the uh, EU is committed to reduction and in the long-term eradication of poverty, and it also recognizes that there has to be a policy coherence between trade policy and its other policies. Um, so this is why um, the GSP system is under review, and, uh, and the EPAs have also already been assessed in terms of um, its co policy coherence. Um, in conclusion, um, the, the recent reviews actually find some problems, although these are acknowledged to be the very powerful tools for uh, for DG trade to achieve these development objectives. We see that still uh, there are some issues related to the existence of sensitive product lists and uh, other um, tar high tariffs on final goods. And the EPAs um, really need some coordination in terms of bringing in LDCs together with the developing countries. So. This will. Um, this is where I'm going to stop my uh, overview. I think. Thank you very much. Dylan, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the conclusions, in particular, especially the GSP, are, are very, very thought-provoking. Uh, it's not a difficult uh, concept uh, in, in, in any sense, is it? Um, I, I think uh, the the way in which the tailor-made liberalisation programmes uh, operate, particularly in some Saharan Africa is, is, is just going to be fascinating in the next couple of uh, years. So we're going to hand over uh, to uh, Joachim Kops, um, who has the unenviable task of running through major security issues of the European Union and the uh, and NATO and the United Nations. So uh, Joachim, over to you. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I'll um, also probably rush through this a lot because we're getting close to um, the end. I um, also have to apologize for the slides. <clears throat> They're supposed to be really nice animations, but I was told um, that animations don't really work, so it's um, a bit of a botched, blotched thing. But let me talk through uh, you talk, talk you through it a bit. And also, if you want the slides, um, do email Amelia or myself, and you get the slides with a full-on animation, Sesame Street style uh, thing. Um, I'll, I promise it's fun. Now, just quickly. The background, um, why is NATO-EU cooperation important? Why, what does that have to do with neighborhoods? Well, in a sense, it is neighborhood, neighborhood of organizations. And of course, um, out of 28 NATO states, 21 are also part of the EU and NATO. So a huge overlap of nearly 80% of memberships. Um, and at the same time, both organizations try, in a sense, to play a role in security that's more and more overlapping. 
um, during the Cold War, you see this on this slide, it was quite nice and neat. You had um, issues of peacekeeping and peace building done by the United Nations. You had hard security and military crisis management issues at the bottom of this slide done by NATO. And in the middle, you had political economic integration done by the EU. With the end of the Cold War, for various reasons I don't want to go into much detail about, um, these dim divisions are more and excuse me, blurred. Mostly, the EU has benefited mostly because it expanded its tasks, it ex expanded its ambitions, um, and also moved into the field of crisis management, especially after the Balkan Wars and the Kosovo War. European leaders realize that it's not enough just to rely on the US and on NATO to intervene, but you have to have your own uh, military capacity. Since Saint-Malo in 1988, when Britain and France agreed to move ahead with the security um, policy in the EU, we have also the problem of how to coordinate EU policies with NATO. Because if the EU, with the 21 member states that are also members of NATO, uh, charges ahead with a military security dimension, What's the point of NATO then, you can ask? Now, if the EU can do anything uh, that also NATO does, then you might ask in the future that NATO might become obsolete. So, of course, the Americans had some uh, things to say about this, um, since they, of course, wanted to preserve NATO, the Brits also, in a sense, and the issue of how to coordinate both organizations to get, to get an effective and efficient outcome was an important issue. And that the answer of the EU was effective multilateralism. And we talked about it a bit in our class, just to you know, remind you. It's this 2003 security strategy concept. Um, you know, the key term was here. The entire objective of the EU in foreign policy is to create an international order that is based on that effective multilateralism. What does it actually mean? Well, it essentially simply means that, uh, well, here we've got Barroso again, you know, this is our key thing, it's our philosophy, effective multilateralism. It simply means that you need coherent cooperation between the EU and its partner organizations. Most importantly, uh, and Barroso reinformed, uh, re reaffirmed this in Munich um, three years ago, it means close cooperation of the EU with the United Nations on the one hand and NATO on the other. That is, in a sense, effective multilateralism. It's just another fancy word for global governance. So if you cooperate closely with NATO and you cooperate closely with the UN in peacekeeping, um, you'll be better off, everyone will be better off in the end. Hopefully also peace um, will be uh, secured through the contribution of these organizations. That's just quickly to remind yourself how complex the cooperation between NATO and the EU is in the field. No one expect anyone to learn this off by heart. I don't know, maybe Amelia will set it as an exam question. No, I don't think so. Um, it is really the kind of difficult result of difficult negotiations of how NATO and the EU should cooperate in the field. That was agreed in 2003. In 2003, the EU launched its first ever military operation in Macedonia. It involved 350 soldiers in the field, and people say it probably involved double the amount of people just to simply draw up this little table and coordinate it. So it was essentially very, very complex cooperation uh, scheme for something that was not really that much of a big mission. Of course, then people said, you know, is that really worth it? Is it worth to, you know, create such difficult cooperation schemes for something that's not really having a big impact in the field? You had the diff um, uh, two different camps. You had the French left camp that was increasingly saying in 2003, you know what, why don't we simply strengthen the EU on its own without um, having uh, uh, this, is, this, this problematic relationship with NATO. You had the British, of course, and supported to an extent by the Americans that wanted to lock the EU closely to NATO. This slide here, again, is an animation. So if you get the slide in, in, in the original format, you will, you will see that this develops step by step. What I wanted to do with this slide is just summarize all the literature and all the um, events that happened since 2003 in the military field. So you have the EU-NATO side on the left and EU-UN side on the other, with beautiful colors, obviously. Um, and it shows the development and evolution of the EU's military mission in partnership with one or the other organization. What is important to know is that the EU's military mission has so far always been carried out in partnership. There's not a single mission that the EU has done that is either without NATO or the UN. But what you can see is that the EU moved away from cooperating with NATO since 2004, 
2004, the Bosnia mission was the last instance of EU-NATO cooperation in the field and instead focused more on the UN side, uh, on the uh, right-hand side. Why? Well, of course, this gives more autonomy to the EU. The EU can present itself as an actor that supports the UN indirectly and uses that in a sense to get away from too much reliance on NATO and too much control from the American side, some people might argue. You could also say it's a genuine attempt to strengthen the UN. From the UN side, the story is different. The UN says, you know what, we'd rather have you Europeans to directly reinforce us, i.e. send more soldiers to UN missions, instead of doing this indirect thing where the UN has a mission and the EU sends a mission to reinforce the UN mission, like they did in the Congo in 2003 and 2006. Uh, many UN policymakers say this is disingenuous. Um, because while we are in trouble, because uh, Western nations like Germany, France, and Britain do not send their troops directly, and that's why we have a weak operation, and then we have to ask the EU in the end to support our weak operation, we could save all this if the Europeans contribute directly to UN operations. So that's a big issue about effective multilateralism, but for whom? Is effective multilateralism simply a, an idea the EU promotes to promote its own activeness, its own growth, its own importance? in international security affairs, or is it really about strengthening and supporting the other organization? It looks, as, at the moment, on balance, that it's more about the EU's own image and the EU's own CSDP. Look at the NATO side. Uh, as I said, since 2004, no cooperation has taken place. Even worse, you have outright competition. NATO AMOS, these, lo these two blocks that you see on the left-hand side, um, that represents that both organizations competed over who should support the African Union with disastrous effects, by the way, in the field. NATO allied provider and EU NAFOR are the two missions uh, launched in Somalia, off the coast of Somalia, to fight piracy. Both organizations launched at the same time without coordination. Doesn't make much sense, but the case is still the same. You have NATO operation and EU operation um, in, the, in, in, in the field there. And finally, you have the battle groups. The battle groups were the idea to, you know, really strengthen EU military capacity. It's 1,500 soldiers, different states cooperate in this. The problem was that a UN brigade, perfectly fine UN brigade, called Sherbrooke, was shut down in 2009 because most EU states that participated in the UN brigade chose to rather reshuffle their energies and uh, political resources into the battle groups and shut down, you know, in times of austerity, the UN brigade. Problem is, I don't know, you could say, who cares who does what, as long as it works. Well, the battle groups don't work. They haven't been um, uh, applied so far. They haven't been used. And instead, um, you have perfectly fine institutions. Of course, there were some problems. I don't want to go into too much detail. But you have institutions that did deploy and that did work, and they are shut down in favor of more uh, EU activists. So that's not to say that the EU should not play a bigger role. It should and it should put more money and political will into CSDP. The problem at the moment is that, you know, the ambitions are higher than what political will and resources really put into. That has impacts for the EU in itself, but also for the partnership the EU has with NATO and the United Nations. Bottom line is, effective multilateralism so far is a great idea. It would be perfect for global governance, but it's unequally implemented at the moment more in favor for the EU to promote its own activeness and its own image and less really a genuinely reinforcing both organizations. That is important, though, for the future of global governance, especially now in the financial crisis where you have to decide where governments put their money. And if you have organizations running side by side without cooperating properly, um, you have key problems in terms of economics and also in terms of promoting peace and security. I'll leave it here. Um, if you have any questions more about that, uh, happy to answer them, and um, also please do ask for the slides so that the entire animation, you know, works. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Joachim. That was that was an excellent overview, um, and I think we've had a very uh, fruitful discussion um, in in terms of going uh, back and forth between uh, the various presenters. I just want to finish up by letting you know that um, the the educational development unit here at the IS is launching a new series of of webinars. We're taking our our webinar dial, if you like, uh, and we're, we're taking it beyond the classroom. 
uh, into something called decoding the EU. Um, they, they come in a package of four, and each one is about an hour, hour and a half sort of crash course across a lunchtime on each um, of the European Union institutions, beginning with the Commission, then the Council, and then the Parliament, uh, and then finally the, the uh, fun world of interinstitutional uh, decision making. So if you feel you'd like to, to, to participate, the, the cost is, is, is kept uh, deliberately low. Uh, if you can only participate in, in one um, and not the others, uh, well, the others are recorded. That's, uh, that's the benefit of, of, of the whole package. Um, so you can feel free to contact me about that. I'll also send um, information to the Euromasters groups. Uh, but if you know people in and around Brussels uh, who said, gee, I'd like to know a little bit more about the EU institutions, where can I go for this sort of information? Please don't hesitate uh, to let them know about this. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for all participating. Uh, I'm afraid that with only five minutes to go and uh, most of the people um, having, having left the room, uh, we're not available to take uh, too many questions. Um, but we have been having some very good chats in the supervised chat room. Uh, Simeon has been hard at work uh, typing away responses with regards to the, uh, the Eastern Partnership. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all on Friday for Alexander's lecture on European Union strategic culture, uh, which is uh, really a cutting edge topic, I think, in many, many ways. Uh, it's going to cover a, a lot of different um, areas and interests and sectors. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all there and to receiving a little guidance for myself uh, about uh, the nature and the requirements and expectations uh, of the briefing note. So thank you very much, and I'll see you on Friday.